this session, um, my name is Anders Larsson, and uh, some of you saw and heard me yesterday, and I am the president of European Patient Forum, and I'm also from Sweden. And uh, I um, represent the patient in Europe, and what European Patient Forum is, are the, uh, we are the umbrellas of the umbrellas in Europe. So um, we are closest to the, uh, becoming a political party. <laughs> so then I'm in the right house. So when you hear the buzz later, it's me voting. <laughs> okay, the theme of this session is real-world evidence moving beyond and hype. And I must say, this is, I love this session. This is really to my heart. Because this is really, really what we're talking about, bringing in the real world evidence, what really works, what really matters into the process. And that is giving real me as a patient a face and blood and genes, whatever it is. And real world evidence also can be related. I will just read through some points here, which I think is very good. And uh, I will give that to you as to put the put the uh, scene on it or a stage. Real world evidence or real world data is data which describes what is really happening when medicines are used in everyday clinical practice. But there is no consensus definition of real world evidence or methods of collecting it. Increasingly, however, if it's acknowledged that medicine use in the real world differs considerably from the traditional clinical trial settings. Real-world evidence could be a way to bridge the efficacy-effectiveness gap that currently exists regarding the information about a medicine's efficacy. Barriers to optimize use of RWE include lack of consensus definition, divergence in policies, lack of harmonization on evidence requirements, lack of standardization of real-world research methods, data protection legislation, skepticism, and cultural barriers. This session, we will hear more about this, and I, I'm very happy to see where all of you, all five of you are coming from and representing. And uh, when we will have been given all the five perspectives, I think we will all, all of us are clear for just to moving on into bringing the real world evidence into the stage. So. The plan is each will speak. When uh, I think you have uh, said enough, then I will tell you. <laughs> we have various lengths of the speech, so that we put the pressure, don't feel the pressure, but I will. And then just to clarify so that you understand what has been said, so then we will have one or two questions after each speech, and then we take the session, and then coming on with your questions. Everyone understands the procedure? Hello. <laughs> Good. Just wakey wakey. Sarah. I think it's better you introduce yourself because okay. you know yourself I know, better. I know who I am, yes. Uh, <laughs> and if you have a problem with that, I'm a psychologist, you know, by profession, oh, so okay. I can help you with that afterwards. <laughs> Great. Well, there you go, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to use my time that I've got, five minutes, um, just to set the stage. Um, I thought it was quite important that we lay some foundations because whenever we speak about real-world evidence, the first discussion is about the terminology um, and what we mean by real-world evidence. Um, so the first slide is just an, the efficacy-effectiveness gap. I don't need to go into this for this audience, um, or at least I th thought I didn't until we started talking about regulatory science, and then I started getting extremely uncomfortable because that's obviously just one bit of the jigsaw. The regulators being very focused on the evidence from the population on the left, whereas what the downstream, including the patients and the clinicians, want to know is how things are going to work in patients that look like me that are very variable and we cannot use the information from these patients to infer from that one it's very difficult um, so next slide is showing where we've got to and this slide I just wanted to give you a visual to show you how complex this world is getting um, we see this very dichotomy real world data pe people go straight to observational it's not like that we're now getting 
a lot more complexity in the methodology. Um, and a lot of my role, I spend my time translating between these dis different disciplines. Um, and where we're going, which is, I hope, is where the convergence between the regulator and the HTA is in this bottom one, these newer methods and analytical designs. Each one of these is a whole lecture. All you need to know is it's getting more and more complex um, and difficult to understand. Um, and then if things weren't complex enough, um, we have something called data science. We're all concentrated on that blue box, the traditional re research using maths and statistics. We're quite familiar with that. This is where the world is going. Um, we've got a whole new set of techniques um, that we need to embrace and start to understand. Um, machine learning, particularly, new ways of analysing data. Um, and we've got a big issue. And the guy that developed this calls the intersection, which is where we need to be, is a unicorn, um, because it's so elusive to actually be in that place. Um, and I think he's actually right um, with that. Um, so what are we doing about it? So the first one, you've heard about Adapt Smart already. So this is, this is an IMI-funded project where we're all sitting on those seats together. So my, I'm firmly sat next to Hans Georg Eichler. I'm firmly sat um, next to Alicia, who's also here, um, trying to find new ways of um, embracing that. And I'm, I'm going to be leading um, a work package called um, this case, evidence generation through the life cycle. And what we're trying to do is understand these methodologies and work out their place. Um, and then I'm just going to stop here because this, this has come up again and again about maps and risks. So I'm just going to give you my take on what we're doing with maps. Um, this is the standard fixed menu um, of drug development that we've been using. We're all used to fixed price menus in a restaurant. You go in, it kind of works for 80% of the people, but there's always the vegetarians, there's people that rock up at five to seven when it finishes at seven, um, people who are allergic to shellfish. It doesn't work for some people. So what we're doing is taking that very standard um, fixed menu and taking those ingredients and recombining them um, to the maps menu. And this is where we are. We start with a safe harbour where we get agreement between the stakeholders. We then have early um, evidence development, so we got, get larger phase two studies, perhaps, maybe, other sorts of data to supplement it. And then the main bit is the patient access with conditional li license and reimbursement agreements. And this confirmatory evidence is really, really important. And this is where the real world data bit comes in. Um, and the next slide, I didn't realise when I put it in that I would have um, a Swedish chair um, who's very tight on times, but well, <laughs> <laughs> um, the issue with maps... Hey, <laughs> The, the issue with maps is we've got to have willing chefs in the kitchen who are willing to take those ingredients and recombine them and think of new ways of doing that. I think we've got some, certainly in Adapt Smart, we've got some willing chefs, um, but the outside world, some of it, I think we've still got some hearts and minds um, to win. Um, so again, what are we doing about it? This is another IMI-sponsored um, project. So there's, there's about four projects in this area. Get Real is just one of them. Um, there's a website. I've given you the ref URL somewhere on there. Um, you can look. What we're trying to do um, in Get Real is just understand those challenges. Um, it's a three-year research project. Um, it, it's going very, very fast. We've got two very statistical packages looking how to analyse real-world data studies, new methods for adjusting for bias. Another one looking at how we um, put the results of those studies together, network meta-analysis, some work on feasibility. So it's a, a consortium that is trying to lay the foundations for that. So watch this space. Um, and this is my last slide, Anders. Um, this is the challenges we're facing. I just wanted to finish. You, you've touched on some of these um, already. Culture change, we shouldn't underestimate that. We, it's taken us, what, 50 years to get to where we are with RCTs. This is a new methodology we've got to embrace. We've got to st skill up on this. We don't have capacity to understand that data. We don't have the technical knowledge. Um, and that's before we get into all the issues um, about confidentiality. Um, the one I see this is as well is we're starting to get a new, I don't use that word paradigm, but we're starting to combine. We've got a very good research system, but now we're actually starting to collect data from care, and we've got to understand where we sit on the ethics. We're not there yet. Um, terminology, again, that's a big barrier to this. Everybody understands different things by real-world data. Um, and then best practice, and this is, I think, number one on my hit list, is critical appraisal tools. So we have to actually start understanding um, what those studies are telling us. And I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stay, stay quiet. Okay. Okay. Is there any um, question in the audience? 
Everything is clear? There is one. Please. One microphone. Okay. Didn't you, didn't you heard what I said? The earlier? Swedish chef, I'll bring, I'll bring I'm, him back. <laughs> I'm, I'm Chandra Seigal from Canada. Um, I think the question is about uncertainty. Yeah. So it's exciting times. I think it's a perfect storm. But at the same time, uh, there is a direct relationship we are seeing uh, between the amount of uncertainty mm -hmm. uh, as well as the um, cost of the new drugs. So there is a direct, it's not an inverse relationship, I think. And uh, my role uh, is more of a surrogate for the payers in Canada, for the public payers in Canada. So uh, all these are exciting times, but at the same time, uh, I think we need to uh, also talk about how to address that uncertainty mm -hmm. until we get where we want to go. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah, and I th think this that, is where real-world evidence... That was not evidence. the question, was No, it, it wasn't. No. It was a statement. So I'm going to... I'll respond to it anyway. Okay. Um, that, is, that is where we need to get to, and this is where I see the role for real-world evidence, is about managing that uncertainty. Um, these drugs will have licences. They're often, um, if we're increasing the regulatory process, we've got to manage that downstream uncertainty properly and do that monitoring just to make sure those patients are safe and we know what's happening. I just okay. took the Swedish chef away because <laughs> that is not the real world <laughs> evidence how Swedish chefs work. So this shows either that you don't understand the topic what yeah. we're talking about or that you're just provocative. I don't uh, know no. this. This no, is a bloody like mark. Would you like me to remove it for you? Yes. That's another speaker Please. behind that. Okay. Next. Okay. Jeff Brown. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, this is going to be fun. Um, <laughs> don't be sure. Don't be sure. Don't be too sure. Okay, so don't, I'll try not to screw it up. Um, and, I, and I'm not going to follow Sarah again. Um, hey. Time check. So I'll do my quick introduction. Um, Jeff Brown, I sit at at the Department of Population Medicine at Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare and Harvard Medical School. Um, I was asked to come here, and thank you so much for asking me to come here. This is, these meetings are fun because it's what we do all day is put in the framework of the rest of the world. So I think, you know, I work on data all day long and like who uses it and why and how does it fit in? So this gives that bigger perspective and I just, it's fun for me. Um, so I'm here, I sit at the coordinating center of FDA's Sentinel now. That was one of the changes I had to make to the slide. We're now called Sentinel instead of Mini Sentinel. Um, if you're in the U.S., you might have heard of PCORnet. We're, I'm at the PCORnet Coordinating Center. Or there's an NIH Collaboratory, which I'm also at that Coordinating Center. So um, this is what we do day to day, is try to how, how to use real-world data for evidence generation, whatever it happens to be. So barriers. Sarah ended with barriers. I'm starting. We, we know these things. Um, we know these things well. I'm just going to highlight uh, a couple. Um, that lead us to kind of complicated decisions. We basically have, we have fragmented healthcare systems essentially all over the world, right? There's no big database that's just sitting there for us. So in the US, it's pretty fragmented. You go to Europe, it's fragmented. I mean, there's, um, it's just the way it goes. And there's competition between the systems. There's confidentiality issues between the systems. And there's, com there's actually competition with the researchers who work on one database and might work on another. And they actually would prefer not to collaborate. And they look for a third party to kind of help do it together, which is actually often the role that we play. Um, but I want to get down to this last piece, um, matching methods data to the questions and the purpose. Fit, fitness for use, uh, appropriate use. Um, uh, if there's anything to take from this, fr from the talk, is the data exists. We know, where is, we know the data are there, we, and we have a requirement to use it. We, we must figure out how to use these data, but we have to do it well. So that's this balance. We can't, uh, I'd really like, to, I, I try to fight the, um, the idea that because the data aren't perfect and the methods aren't perfect, we can't do anything with it. You just have to make sure you know what to do and when to say no, um, which is actually often what we do um, sitting at the Sentinel Coordinating Center. So the real brief history of Sentinel uh, started the FDA Amendments Act, a bunch of contracts. We did a pilot for about five years, and now we're running um, the Sentinel, the full Sentinel, so we took the mini off. 
the, the story is, or the tagline here should be, the Sentinel system it is a functional system. We do hundreds of queries a year with data. We've probably got 10 in the, in the system right now. We're, doing, we're using these data all the time. It's a big distributed network. It's 100 and something million. It's probably 180 million kind of covered lives in the network now. And it can be done. We are generating uh, information that's used by FDA. So this is FDA, um, but it could be for anyone, um, how you play it out. I just wanted, to, someone mentioned collaboration. Yeah, collaboration is incredibly important. We have, I have 18 data partners are listed here. I think I have 30 or 35 subcontractors as part of uh, the Sentinel project, and it kind of keeps growing. And everyone's got to be happy. You have to try to make everyone happy, which means they have to have a reason to do this, um, or they just won't. So um, it, it isn't easy, and it's actually what I spend a lot of my time on, is just dealing with making sure the whole thing doesn't collapse um, under its own weight. Um, so we wanted to talk, uh, I want to do the end with the, uh, basically a little story. Um, so this is uh, some of the work we've done in Mini Sentinel, which actually, it was supposed to just be a pilot, and it turns out that we helped inform a couple policy changes at, at FDA, which is nice. I'm going to really just tell the story of, I don't know how to pronounce it, I don't know if it's the Bigotran or Dabigatran, we have a debate about it, I don't know, even know who makes it, uh, and I actually don't even know what I'm going to say now. Um, <laughs> um, so... Um, I really don't. Uh, the story, <laughs> I could pick any of these others as the topics. So um, I'm, I'm going to point to the, the, um, the reference at the bottom, because the, the Southworth paper is actually a really nice description of how FDA thought about this problem. But so what really happened? Um, Dabigatran uh, is on the market. A lot of reports to the adverse event reporting system of bleeding. So, okay, new drug reports of bleeding. But when you compare those reports to warfarin, there's no reports of bleeding anymore for warfarin, right? So everyone thought it was probably a reporting bias. But it's there. It was something that, that pops up on FDA's radar. However that system works, it pops up, and it looked like a big deal. Because who reports, I think, probably, because who reports warfarin bleeds now? Um, but who knows? I think in the old days, and the old days were probably four years ago, you basically throw your hands up and say, well, we don't know if it's true or not. You go to look for other information. Maybe you spend a million dollars and do an epi study, and you wait four years to get the results. And that's where we were four years ago. When this happened, uh, FDA came to Sentinel and said, what do you see in your data? So we go out to our database and say, actually, we don't see what you're seeing there. We see, we actually saw a lower rate, but the way we would frame it is, we saw no difference. There's no evidence that the bigger trend had a higher rate of bleeds. In our data, we looked at it maybe 100 different ways, and this was all rapid cycle. So this is FDA, this is, takes weeks to get these answers, not months, not years. Uh, so that's the big change. Now we helped inform I think essentially, and the way that the paper describes it is, uh, it gave us a little bit of information, it gave us, it was the FDA, a little bit of information between the time the signal appears and the time that a full epi study, which they did fund, would give them information. So they had the choice of knowing nothing until the epi study is done, or knowing something in the interim. And so they chose to know something, even though they know it was observational, and they know they didn't have all the covariates they would want and all the messiness, but they wanted something. So um, I see that as a pretty, it's, that has happened over and over again. This is just a, a worked example of the kinds of uses for some of the real world data, particularly from, this, from the regulator side. Um, I'm not at FDA, that, but the paper describes this, kind of, this cycle pretty nicely. And I think that is it. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Any question? This one. So how no, wait, 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 wait. The <laughs> microphone. No one can hear you. I, I told you earlier. No, you can hear me. No? <laughs> you can hear me. Mike? I'm, hi, I'm Barbara Handel in Biopontus Alliance for Rare Diseases. I just have a um, question about how, how frequently is data coming in to the Sentinel system? So when you are going out to sure. do a query about whatever the question is, how live is the, is the data that you're looking at? Yeah, so the in kind of status quo, kind of routine 
cycles, we update the big data partners, which are most of the data, update their data about every three months, and the data that they update are anywhere between three and six months old. So we're probably about six, we're probably about six to nine months behind when we're doing the, uh, the analyses. But all, we have 18 partners, and they're updating at different frequencies, so there's actually new information coming through all the time, but that new information is six months old. Think about it that way, right, because the claims data. We can get at information more quickly, so we've looked at what do you do about flu surveillance. Well, flu vaccine surveillance, you can't wait six months. Um, so the partners are able to get at essentially live data, but it'll just be a little messier, basically a little messier and a little more expensive. Because of because of the way we have to do it, but we've done that, uh, we've kind of done these pilots to do it. Okay. And ultimately, are you dependent on on individual physicians contributing data, or are you? Oh uh, yeah. So health insurers, the Sentinel network is in is all health insurers except now we have one hospital system. We just added a hospital system, but these are health insurers. Good. Okay. The mic. Can the microphone fly over there? <laughs> are you encouraging a yeah. pass? Yeah, pass? why not? We are in the baseball <laughs> country. <laughs> so, just to clarify, so Donald Singer, European Therapeutics Association, you mentioned dabigatran, however you pronounce it. it, do, it it's, it's there to reduce risk of clotting, and you'd expect increased risk of bleeding. Uh, well, just to clarify, are you saying there's no risk of bleeding in excess of warfarin or no increased risk of bleeding at all in your database? So this was in comparison to warfarin. So this was, this was specifically to warfarin. This was the signal appears, you know, a light goes off somewhere, and then it's, is this basically the question that FDA wanted to know is, am I facing a public health emergency or not right now? Because we have this new drug, a lot of people are taking it, and if it has twice the rate of bleeds as the current therapy, that's a big problem. So it was, is this an emergency, or um, can we kind of watch this play out? Was, the, was essentially the question. And, and just one, one brief follow-up on, on the same point, because you, physicians in the UK and elsewhere get complacent, and they know warfarin causes bleeds, so they forget, they forget to report them. So you'd expect under-reporting with warfarin compared to dabigatran. Do, do you have a proactive part to your system so you make sure people are always recording, or are you just relying on what people get round to reporting? So in the Sentinel system, these are all health insurer, these are all health insurance data, so this is, um, clinicians requesting reimbursement from an insurance company. So we, we see medically attended care that gets reimbursed. Wasn't that the same question she put? The terminology is not, you know, changes. Ah, uh he's -huh, English, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point, the physician has to make a no. Yeah, but no. yeah. exactly, but we have a, legis we have a legislation we in your <laughs> pharmacoviglians that everyone should report it in and uh, the uh, patient should do it directly to the government, things like that, but the government doesn't want that to happen, so then there are no bridges at all. So you, you need to swing yourself. Okay, next speaker. I surrendered this one, so uh, do you have slides? No, I don't have slides. Okay. Mark Berger, you have a very strong title here. I know, that's Wise not me. Vice President. <laughs> of, that's not you. No, okay, that's one day. Another one. Maybe okay. one day. Okay, Vice President, Real World Data and Analytics. That is the person that who would very much have loved to be here. Ah. But unfortunately, due to family events, he couldn't be here. So okay. I'm standing in for Mark. So my name's Adam Heafield. I work um, in the same part of Pfizer as Mark Berger, so in the global health and value, which is essentially the outcomes research yeah. and market access bit. Mark runs a new team, relatively new team, uh, which is the Real World Data and Analytics team. So we created a, speci a specialist function just, just definite to keep that picture up. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's got right. So, uh, but I'm in a different bit, which is the innovation centre. So we're looking not just at the real-world data stuff. We're also looking at adaptive pathways and um, many of the things that the conference has dealt with already. Um, when I was thinking about what to say, I mean, I, I was just reflecting that actually, although we're talking about moving beyond the hype, the hype in many ways can be helpful. I think, in particular maybe not as hype, uh, but as a way of pushing us to keep am being ambitious about what we can do and to try new things and keep the experimentation. So I think in some ways moving beyond the hype is fine, but we also need to re retain some of that forward-looking ambition and, and big picture thinking. But what I really wanted to go through today were some practical examples of what Pfizer is doing now with real-world data. Um, it reflects actually a lot of what Jeff 
uh, talked about. Many of the issue it reminded me a lot when you were going through what you were doing. Um, so the first thing to say about real-world data is that it is used routinely across many functions within Pfizer, um, from R&D through to commercial. Um, what we've done and what Mark's team have done uh, that I think is different um, is rather than having individual teams accessing data sets to make individual decisions for themselves, that was centralised. So we took all the data that people were using, all the data sets that we could licence and put them together in, in what's called the Data Mart at Pfizer. Um, it contains claims data, it contains some electronic health records data, anonymised. Most of the data comes from the US, there's a little bit from the UK. And we've added some functionality to allow those data sets, to, to, to allow the queries that we want to formulate to cut across those different data sets. Um, and what we found by doing that and by having it in-house and by having some momentum behind the expertise and the use of this is dramatic reductions in cycle times so we can make quick decisions, days, not weeks or months. Um, and that, that's, that's been very successful. Um, and what do we use it for? Um, so the, the applications are often about epidemiology. Um, so where are patients, what, what are they, where do they live, what happens to them, how many patients, particular um, types of disease do we have. A lot of work to analyse unmet need um, and to try and quantify that and again to be a bit more granular about where the unmet need exists um, within health systems, where are patients who apparently have a therapy not being treated well, what, what's happening to them? Where, not what, what type of patients are they? Where do they live? What's, what, what's their experience of going through the healthcare system? And a lot of that is used to inform trial design. So is there an identifiable subgroup of people who are not being well treated at the moment? Do they constitute a cohort that we could design a study around? If so, where are they? Are there enough of them? So you can generate a lot of information that informs our planning uh, for, from this kind of work. I think the work is now extending more into a bit more comparative effectiveness and outcomes-based work, but the core of it is in that epidemiology and understanding how health systems work. So these are not always the big questions that we've heard about adaptive pathways and maps, but these are incredibly important questions when you're doing drug development. You need to know who's ill, what's wrong with them, where are they, can you make a difference? And in particular, I think that there's an enormous issue about how are patients cycling through healthcare systems, who's not being treated well, uh, and that it's very easy to read the label and think, well, there's a treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, that's done. But actually, the lived experience of patients is very different from that. So we're trying to uncover what those things are. And I think um, one, of the, one of the issues here is that there are some diseases for which this is kind of perfect. So rheumatoid arthritis is a good example. <laughs> Lupus might be another, sickle cell disease, where there are episodic flares, you know, crises days, how do you track those patients through a system? Where can you under identify where they're not being cared for well? Is that lack of therapeutic options or is it something else in the system? Um, th the other thing to say is that this kind of claims data and the EHR work and these questions, we're not substituting for RCT data. We want the data about the healthcare system. We're not, you, you couldn't run an RCT to show how people are cycling through it. That's, that's not what you're doing. So again, to Jeff's point, the data are the right data for the questions that we have. Um, so this is where we're experimenting. We're, we're trying to push it a bit further too. So, so why does it work? Um, I think that the critical thing for us is about the, re the, the reduced time to deliver an answer. Um, and in some areas for us, this may not be a big public policy question, but for things like business development, licensing, partnering opportunities, we need to be quick, right? It's competitive out there. And so it delivers competitive advantage for us to make a better decision than another company quicker than they can. Um, I think it's also developed a lot of improvements in our planning and resourcing clinical trials, understanding where we should be focusing, how we could do that. Another, another point that comes up sometimes, particularly in the US context, is it allows us to use the same data that our customers use, or at least the health insurers use. And when you're trying to solve customer problems or health insurer problems with your new medicines, that's very helpful to actually be interrogating and talking about the same information. So that's another thing that, that comes up uh, sometimes. Um, I think the other thing that we found is that we can combine those data sets you don't need a monolithic solution where everybody's data is harmonised, standardised. It's possible to do that. It may limit the exact nature of the answers you get or the kinds of questions that you can address fully, but it's working, right? So you, it, I think, and particularly in some of the discussions that happen in Europe, the, 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 there's a, 
a, a natural instinct to try and harmonize and bring everything together and make it standard. And it can create a lot of barriers to actually getting stuff done. So at the moment, we can get some stuff done, and, and, that, and that's good. And I just wanted to close by thinking, how would we like this to evolve? So one of the things, actually, is to get more people at Pfizer who are making decisions to use this stuff, right? So there are other ways that you can identify unmet need. There are, you, know, you can have an ad board, you can have a conversation. There are lots of other tools and ways of getting those insights in, but we need more people to be using this information. Some people use it all the time, and they're doing very well. I think the other thing is to spread, the, uh, to get more data like this that we can use and pull in this way. And I think particularly on the geographic scope, that would be a really huge success for us. Um, I think the increased focus on outcomes and comparative effectiveness work would be another thing that we'd like to do more work on. Again, do the data support that kind of questions and interrogations at the moment? And then the final thing is the standards for analytics keeps coming up. So when we're making a decision about do we want to license or agree with, if it's a business development competitive environment, we just need to make a better decision than company X, Y, Z. If we're taking information to a regulatory decision or reimbursement decision, we might need slightly different standards about how we've done it. Does it comply with what's required? And that's a kind of big conversation about, Sarah's mentioned as well. So I think... Fitting the data to the question that we have is the really important thing for us. And there are, according to the questions that we have, we have different consequences and different needs for what comes next. But so far, it's working very well, um, so we're very pleased with it, um, and we're looking to it, expand that work. But um, so far, so good. Anyway, I hope that's helpful. Okay, thank you. What about, uh, I'm just reflecting, you said fitting the data to the question you have. What about if your question is wrong? Well, how, um, how do you uh, assess them? That would be so if we were running an RCT, you can have the wrong question. So I think you, you need to, the, the way that you stop having the wrong question um, is just the skill of doing the work. And in many ways, a lot of the other things that are going on, particularly in Europe, um, about early dialogues, early advice, and discussing more broadly what the questions you're trying to answer are is one good way of addressing that. So, yeah, we can, we can, I promise you we'll still come up with the wrong question occasionally. But. <laughs> because the real-world data is, is, we are not used to that yet, so we don't know what kind of data will come in. We can't be that sure. That's why the question also needs to be adapted. Any questions? Ah, microphone. Hi, I'm Roxana Draghi, I'm from the Commission. Uh, so, uh, you've mentioned that harmonization in Europe can create barriers. Can you give me, you know, two or three examples of what <laughs> those barriers would be? All I was saying, I, I, it, so in some cases it will be essential, right? And so some of the work we've done on rare diseases where you've got very small numbers of patients in one country the, the, the work that the Commission has worked through the JRC and others to pull that information together, that's incredibly important. And that's vital to doing that work on those, those questions. I think I, maybe it's to, to Sarah's point of culture change. That you, you can find all kinds of excuses not to change what you do. And one of them is to say, oh, we don't have enough data. It's all scattered all over the place. I, I, uh, I can't do anything. So I wasn't saying that the moves to harmonization where they work are not desirable. It's just I don't think we should stop doing anything until we have a European registry on everybody with diabetes in all its formulations over, you know, that, that's, so, that, so, so some of it's absolutely essential and needed. But I think we should keep going in the meantime. That's all. Okay. Dave Dvorak, Oracle. Just a quick question. These data inherently are messy and dirty. Mm -hmm. So do you use them to find directionally correct or directionally suggesting outcomes? Or do you put any kind of definitive outcome measures based on those analyses? And then how big are the data sources that you would really need to give you some level of confidence into the, into the certainty of the answer? Well, I think... I think you need, to, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? So sometimes you just find there aren't the data you need to answer the question. So actually we did some work with Vital Transformation uh, a couple of years ago about identifying patients for clinical studies, looking at some of the UK data. For some markers we were looking at for a cancer trial, they're not stored. So you 
ask the question and it's not there and you don't you haven't got anywhere. So you get a spectrum of answers. So you may have you may hit a question where you've got perfect data, really great data that addresses it, and then you may be able to assign a greater level of confidence to that, but you might get something messy in between. So I'm sorry that's not a very clear answer, but it slightly depends on the data and matching if you're lucky, you get great certainty. If you're not, you have to look elsewhere. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mark. Well, great. Thank you very welcome. much. I no introductions anymore. That's really good. No, no PowerPoint. We're okay. Um, my name is Mark Pearson. I'm an economist. Sorry, Alistair. Um, but you, you might not forgive me by the end. You shouldn't forgive me before I've spoken, should you? Uh, from something called the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is, I suppose, the best way of thinking of it is a club of developed countries, inter intergovernmental organization. And the idea is that we help countries learn off each other's policy experience. And you know, we like to say that we learn from each other's good examples. In fact, the real reality is that we try and learn from each other's tragic mistakes to make sure that the other countries don't make the mistakes. And I, uh, I suppose one of the key things that's coming up is that I really need to say at the start is that it's not by accident that we're having to start to look at pharmaceutical pricing more generally. I suppose if you'd asked us five years ago how much work we were doing on pharmaceutical pricing, it would be a lot less than now. I mean, it's become a hot political topic. We're getting now heads of state who are bothered about it. That means that we're starting to have to, to work much more at, it, at this sort of issue, such as real-world evidence, uh, at the OECD, so that because there is policy movement going on. And this came home to me, actually, I suppose, a little bit on Monday when I was at another event on an entirely different topic and the main speaker was late arriving and I was sitting next to the, the ambassador from a, uh, a European country and he was trying to persuade me to come and speak in his country today and I was explaining I couldn't because I was going to be here speaking on this topic. Before he was ambassador, he used to be the head of the finance ministry in his country. And uh, so he was asking me what I was going to say, and I, we ended up having about 20 minutes, half an hour, talking about real-world evidence. And at the end of that, he said to me, uh, as he was walking away, actually, that one of his biggest mistakes when he'd been at the Ministry of Finance was that he once said that the health ministry people are full of very clever people who spend all their time burning money. And this was picked up by a microphone and became a bit of a scandal in that country. <laughs> He said after I told him about real-world evidence and the difficulties of using it for pharmaceutical uh, pricing and pharmaceutical reimbursement decisions, he wished he'd modified what he said and he should have said that the health system is full of idiots who spend all their time <laughs> burning money. I think that probably suggests I didn't do a particularly good job in explaining <laughs> the problems that we face. But given that we have a very short period of time, let me just summarize the... <laughs> He's still an ambassador. Uh, summarize really the main message that I suppose we feel from looking at the evidence on. On use of real world evidence uh, to inform pricing and reimbursement decisions, so particularly on that use of real, real world evidence. It's clearly going up. It's, I'll give you some numbers in a bit about how many countries are now using this. But it's also very clear that the feedback that everybody's given us, it's very cumbersome to use at the moment. It requires a lot of, of expertise at the payers level, which they don't really have, it takes a lot of time, uh, and therefore the risk is that it becomes rather a niche uh, use of, of pharmaceutical pricing and reimbursement decisions. If it's to become more routine, that means that we're going to have to find ways in particular of making the data that we use much more the routine data rather than requiring special data collections, as usually is the case at the moment. And to, make, to be able to do that, we're going to have to make progress on those horribly difficult issues of electronic health records and overcoming data silos, which people have already talked about. And to do that, we'll have to, coming back to, to what Sarah said at the beginning, we actually need a new mindset, uh, a new approach uh, a new way of looking at, particularly about secondary use of data um, in, from our health systems. 
Very, very quickly then, a couple of things that I should s say along those lines. Uh, we just did a quick survey in the last couple of months actually on how many countries of the 34 OECD countries are now using real-world evidence, at least sometimes, when they're doing uh, their reimbursement systems, and we're up to 13. So it's growing pretty rapidly. Uh, it's definitely getting more and more embedded in the systems. Obviously, two main forms that we're seeing, you've got the, the coverage with evidence development, so a commitment to pay at a certain price, but only for a fixed period, you know, Medicare, Belgium, Netherlands, Switzerland. And then the more, I suppose, ambitious form, the, the outcome-based managed entry agreements, uh, where the price reflects the actual performance of the product in real life, and you're seeing that in Italy, especially UK, Australia. When we look at the feedback from the countries about how they think these systems are performing, the positives, well, yes, they're certainly allowing quicker access to promising treatments. They are helping get more value-based pricing, which is an objective of many countries, into their pricing policies. And, of course, they're being able to use uh, different pricing for different indications, which, again, is something that many countries, of course, have been struggling with. Um, the negatives, that I've already said the main one, the, the cost, they're taking a lot of energy to negotiate and the payers are finding that hard. They don't really have the expertise or the quantity of people or indeed the, the political uh, capital to be able to, to do a lot of these real-world um, evidence agreements. And as a result, there's clearly a view at the moment that this is going down a route where it will only be used in certain special cases. And that is concerning the policymakers. The other thing that's really concerning them is the fact that many of these agreements are requiring special data collection. So, you know, Italy is the classic example. They, they have, I think, a, by now 78 different therapeutic indications where they've used um, uh, outcome-based uh, entry agreements. For each of those, they're effectively creating a separate register in order to collect the data that they can use in order to evaluate whether the real-world evidence is such that they can be uh, reimbursing that. First of all, that's a great waste of effort to create all those different registries. More than that, all of these have remained confidential. And so whatever anybody wants to say about collecting uh, evidence in order that we can actually expand the scientific base. Actually, we're almost doing the opposite at the moment. We're going down this route of creating more data silos just to be able to do the real-world evidence, which is really rather paradoxical, isn't it? Um, I mean, that really can't be the way that we should be going. Of course, the reason why that's happening is, you all know, the, the electronic health record implementation, very variable across countries, uh, often really not up to the standards that you need. Of course, you could do a lot more, as we've already heard from, uh, from Jeff, when it, just by actually using the most basic databases that nearly every country has administrative claims linked with a unique patient identifier, you should be able to come up with some pretty good safety and effectiveness data. And some countries like Korea, for example, are doing really well at, at doing that. But generally speaking, um, you'd want to be able to match the sort of data that we have already, match it together so that you can actually get a better view of what's happening without actually going down this route of creating special registries each time we do a new pricing agreement. And yet we do that really badly. I mean, if you look at how electronic health records are actually used, we recently, in 2012, we looked at uh, 25 of our countries only four countries, for example, were using their electronic health records to identify people for RCTs. Only nine of the, the 25 were using their electronic health records to monitor patient safety. Um, moving on to start looking at data silos, uh, if you look at all the different sorts of data sets that countries have, about a quarter of these advanced countries don't try and use the same unique patient identifier across data sets, so they can't even try to match data. Even when that is possible, it's amazing how rarely we actually manage to, to match data across data sets. I mean, a, a good example, mental 
hospitals, mental health hospitals. All 22 countries we looked at have some patient uh, hospital-based records for inpatients uh, in mental health hospitals. Only six of them link the data in a way that they can actually say something about the quality of care being provided, link it to, to primary care data or link it to various other registries that they've got. Uh, if cancer's a little better, maybe 11 out of 19 can do that. So we're not actually using the data that we've got, hence this, this stupid dead end of going down uh, the roots of creating special registries in order to look at what's happening in the real world. You know, I think various of the other speakers have already said what's going to need to happen uh, in order to change that. Certainly, we need much stronger governance in our, of our health data so that we can actually uh, start putting together these data sets. But we're also going to have to address the, the privacy uh, issue head on and, and actually change the way that people uh, view this. It isn't about... Um, guaranteeing health privacy, what we need to start talking about is privacy-sensitive use of health data. That, of course, is what we really need to be using, and that means that we should be talking about what safeguards are in place, rather than just making blanket statements about health data, your personal health data, being um, somehow you have all sorts of rights and privacies uh, guarantees over that. And above all, we need this, this new mindset, I suppose, to start thinking about data instead of it being a private resource. We have to start thinking about how we can enhance uh, knowledge of health and diseases and how we can improve the health system efficiency. Thank you very much. A bit more than five minutes. Sorry yeah. for that. No, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I said earlier that this is my favorite topic, this real-world evidence. I'm starting to be a little sad now and, and scared <laughs> because it, it is like real world evidence showing my world, showing exactly how I experience things, what I'm doing, what happened to me. Now I get the feeling that this kind of information, we are trying to put it in the system, but we, we will not change the system. So we are adapting the data we are pushing in in order not so we don't have to change the system. It's, because we were talking a little about earlier, so you're a social affair man, so you, you need to know what I'm talking about. Social implication, if I have this treatment or that treatment, may have enormous effect in my social life. If I can come back and start to work again, pay tax again, take care of myself, that is not healthcare. So why then those areas should be opened up as well? This is not the question. I well, well, I'm, I'm I, doing, I, but you, you can make no, it I as want, well. I want, I want to answer then, it, though. Then how on earth <laughs> should we make all these fancy comp uh, countries you have for them to realize that and change the way they're going to deal with it? Well, I mean, Otherwise, what, we will not learn. What, one of the big data sets that we are missing is, of course, on patient-reported outcome measurement. Yeah. And, and, you know, of course, the UK has been pushing this and making a lot of progress I think other countries should also be going down that route. There's an awful lot of small level movement going on, but, but nothing really big happening in, in many countries. And I think it should. I mean, I think actually if you're trying to talk about value in the health system, which ultimately what this is all about is to try and identify where we have value that we can exploit, then we need to know what people value. And that means we need to start building in data on patient reported, people reported, um, outcomes, what matters to them, and put that into but the system. I, I will not give you square boxes uh, as long as you always push them in red, a round circle hole. Mm. You know, I taught my kid that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yes, but... Good. Yes. I'll shut up. Any question? <laughs> Any question? No. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Least but not le last. Last but not least, I mean. <laughs> I don't normally feel apprehensive when I'm coming up to <laughs> present, but... That means that you're on your toes. I, I have no slides, but I'd quite like the Swedish chef one, if I, that would be possible. Can borrow that from Sarah. <laughs> she will love that. So, um, I wanted to use my five minutes, if I have five minutes. You can have ten. Oh, thank you. Um, 
to talk to talk about the some of the macro trends, and I think some of the other speakers have kind of talked to, to this as well, particularly looking at, at, at value, um, you know, as it's seen across the sort of health sciences ecosystem. So you can't talk about real world evidence, not talk about healthcare. Clearly, we're seeing a massive shift there in terms of the, the move from fee for service to fee for value, value based reimbursement. And, you know, obviously, from a US perspective, CMS spend just over 500 billion planning to move about 50% of that to value-based care by 2018. Commercial payers spend just over 900 billion, planning to move 75% of that to value-based care um, by 2020. So, you know, put, put real simply, the public and private payers are starting to shift that um, quality and cost risk back to the providers. Now, of course, that risk is also shifting um, in terms of the way that farmers see that that ecosystem. So what I mean by that is that sort of shift to value-based care um, you know, represents a number of major challenges to pharma because uh, it does get at the fundamentals of the business model if they're paid more on outcomes rather than on, say, tablets per se. So you know, for years, farmers competed based on medical differentiation of their products and often uh, you know, sophistication of their sales and, and marketing. Uh, where regulatory approval was about safety, efficacy, and meeting an unmet medical need. Um, the reality today, of course, is the payers um, are starting to look for cost effectiveness, comparative effectiveness research, uh, using real-world data. And I think, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get uh, into this in the discussion, but just the actual mechanics of bringing together clinical trial data, EHR data, claims data, remote patient monitoring data, self-reported patient data. I mean, it just goes on and on, and it truly is a, a big data challenge. And you know, whilst I agree with the comment that was made earlier, you don't have to put it all into one big database, the reality is you do need some consistency across that data, uh, even if it's just the level of a consistent, unique identifier for the patient. Um, so there's some real challenges there, even before you get into the analytics uh, and the best practices around analyzing that kind of uh, that kind of data, you know, but at a, at a higher level, I do think, um, you know, from a farmer perspective, it does present a number of major challenges. One sort of strategic in that the farmer needs to decide the role they want to play in terms of what, what are the products and services they want to, deli to deliver, how do they want to structure them, um, and then an organisational one. And somebody touched upon it earlier. You know, we've been speaking about R and D coming closer together in pharma for a long time. Now it's very much about R and D and the commercial organisations coming together. Um, but if you look at that treatment ecosystem, um, you know, with health systems increasingly moving towards outcomes, then the question I think to ask is, who's going to orchestrate all the inputs into this kind of analysis? So, you know, whether it's the drugs, the diagnostics, the medical technologies, the care management, the care delivery, the health information itself, um, there's a role to orchestrate all that. Maybe it's going to be the payers, maybe it's going to be the providers, could be the farmer. Um, there's for sure some meaty IT that underpins it um, in terms of aggregating all that data. And I'm real sorry I couldn't make the event yesterday, but I know you had a, uh, a discussion on precision medicine. I, I do want to flag that because the reality in terms of real world data is we're kind of in a little bit of state of denial. I mean, for many of the organizations, many in the US uh, that are leading academic medical centers, they are using genomics in clinical care today. So gene panel, whole exome, uh, whole genome data, people are making clinical decisions and that that's quite remarkable. So this area has always been moving fast, but the last two years or so, that translation from being a big research activity to one that actually impacted clinical care has happened a lot quicker than I think anybody um, envisaged. And you know, what I think what's made that particularly interesting is you know, pharma have embraced that. So um, AstraZeneca put out a paper a couple of years back that was an analysis of their R&D pipeline, and about 85% of the projects there have a personalized healthcare strategy. Uh, Roche now have a companion diagnostic for over half of their, uh, for half of their drugs in development. So you know, it, it has been embraced by the pharma, but at the same time, it's been embraced in a healthcare setting as well. So we have people making therapy uh, decisions. Finish off, I just wanted to make a point um, that ties back to real world data. So um, if the precision medicine area needed any more publicity, uh, it got it when President Obama announced the Precision Medicine Initiative in the State of the Union. 
Um, and the, you know, the, the, the desire to sequence a million uh, patients. The reason I wanted to bring that up is there are a number of regulatory reforms which are critical, which tie back to real-world evidence, uh, I think, if that initiative is going to be successful. So I think we do have an obligation to look at privacy here um, and to rethink that, because actually the reality is for many of the sort of large studies that we need to conduct where we aggregate data, it's very difficult to do that with the current HIPAA and slew of state and federal regulations. And it, it's, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, what's actually happening is it's kind of constraining a lot of the, um, a lot of the collaborative research that we all know needs to happen um, for that initiative to be successful. Second, we're still struggling with interoperability. I mean, the ONC put out a, another 10-year roadmap a few months back talking about better integration with the HRs, and um, you know, we, we've been... We've been at this for a while, and it's, it's still tough. Um, and I do think the Precision Medicine Initiative is an opportunity to reboot the system, actually, um, and look at how we make all this real-world data accessible to all the different people in that ecosystem, uh, and to do it focused around that initiative rather than just say we need to fix interoperability in healthcare, which, you know, frankly, we've struggled with. And I, I think somebody else touched upon it earlier. There's a lot of bottom-up market signals in terms of patients co-owning their own health record. So flip the clinic, get my health data, um, which is all about enabling patients to, um, you know, to work with their data online, much like you do in banking, in retail, and in, in travel. So you know, those, those tools are coming for sure, and I think that's, that's going to create a whole new uh, you know, tsunami of data that's going to come into this, into this space. So I think the point I'm, I'm trying to make just to finish off is, you know, the health sciences ecosystem is evolving at quite a rate, as are the major constituents that make up that ecosystem. Uh, and data is going to be absolutely central in helping to shape which sort of organizations are, are well placed to succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Adam? Okay. Time for questions. Okay, audience, wake up. Um, so, uh, hi, Laura Esterman, San Francisco. Uh, I think the idea of moving beyond to real world evidence really requires a wholesale change in clinical practice. You know, we are the systems that we use for clinical practice are based on sort of this kind of soap node and something that we introduced, I think, in the 1950s and kind of used in a different way. I think we have to think about um, changing, changing the way in which we collect evidence in a very simple, structured way, like in checklists or, and so on, that then can be disseminated around the world and shared. Because I think that if you want to, if you want to be able to track what's going on and you want to be able to accelerate the approval of, of agents, I don't think you should do that unless um, there's a way really of careful tracking out into the population. And that means that there has to be some kind of discipline in the way in which we collect information in the clinical sense. And the reason you would do that is if we tied it to access to new medicines or to new treatments. And I think as a way for that serves actually the regulators and it serves the patients. Because, and it serves the clinical community. I don't know how you can do a good job of decision making if you really don't know how something is performing and how it's performing for a particular biological condition. So I'm wondering, you know, how, you know, the people who want to move beyond the hype and get to it, I mean, nothing's ever going to work as well out in practice. But things, you know, how are you going to know? And I think if we don't address a wholesale call for a change in practice, I don't know how we get to where we want to be. So, Are you ending up in the question? What's it? No, so I'm just asking what people think about where's, where's the pressure point? You know, and, and, and I think one of the things that we all have to, to think about is really putting pressure on the way we practice medicine and, and collect and disseminate information from the clinic. So I wonder what people think about that. Okay. Does anyone of you would like to say something? Well, why, why don't I start? I, I'm not sure 
that I'm necessarily the best person to answer what you're saying, but I do think you can see uh, differences across countries in how they try and learn from uh, real-world evidence. I mean, I, I think I'm tempted to say Sweden is a positive example that we can pick on here. Well, I think you can say that they've actually tried to use the registry system that they've got in order to try and keep their clinical practice guidelines up to date, revised regularly, and then try and get the physicians and the other medical practitioners to follow those. And there are some particular examples of spectacular success you know, in orthopedics. It's true that the big weakness in all that is actually trying to get the physicians and medical practitioners to follow the clinical practice guidelines. That's usually where we get a block. But in Sweden, at least, they are trying to use all that evidence to keep those, those guidelines up to date in a more systematic way, I think, than in most other countries. So there are some positive uh, examples to try and follow. I'm sorry to hear that, that if Sweden is the lead and we in Sweden, what we think about it internally, we, we don't think that we are in the lead because there's a lot of errors and a lot of things needed to be changed in order to make the switch. So, but we, we can uh, carry yeah. the torch further. So, um, did I jump in? Are you guys looking? All right. Um, I have this conversation a lot uh, about how to get the data to be better, and I always encourage every, I, we're stuck working with the data that we have. Right, so then the next question is, well, how do you get it better? Asking nicely doesn't work. Uh, it just doesn't. Um, my answer is always, in the US, ask Medicare to require it, period. It's simply money. Docs will do it if, it re if it's required. I, I'm also a health economist. Uh, so um, if, if, it, so if, you, if Medicare required a piece of information, it will happen. Uh, if ONC asks really nicely, it won't. And that's what we see, and I do a little survey on the soccer field every weekend where my kids play. I have a lot of docs, friends, who, who are doctors. And I say, how do you handle you know, the information you put in the system? They say, I document really well the 10 fields that I need to get paid. And then I scribble everything else down in a note. And if you want me to put the 11th field in nicely, it's going to be, it has to be required. I'm simply too busy. Um, and so that's why the EHR data are mostly unusable for, for this kind of work. So okay. tie it to money. Okay. Can I just add one other thing? So one of the other elements, I think, of what's changing in the healthcare ecosystem is the points of decision and lots of the things we talk about, particularly in real-world data, are very centralized things. They're about, you, you mentioned pricing. This is a centralized decision in most European countries. And so when you think about that as what you're trying to solve with real-world evidence, all the real-world evidence work becomes very centralized. It's about how do you support a central government decision. What we see in many countries is that that kind of stuff's also slightly being bypassed because you're also having to negotiate in a much more market sense with local hospitals, with local trusts, with other components, smaller groups within the healthcare system. And I don't know where this ends up, but to your point about how do you get clinicians to lead on this, if they're in charge of their budgets and their pricing and their negotiations, if, if the health system starts to fragment away from a very central controlled one, then I think you, you won't get standardization from all those components, but you may get some who start to innovate and do differently and try and compete with their neighboring practices because they've got better data, they are bothering to store it. So I think you, you can incentivize, and it's absolutely right that you need to get the incentives aligned to what you're trying to do, but there are other ways of thinking about healthcare. And one of the things we see when we talk to doctors across Europe in particular, they say things like, uh, but thanks for telling us about your new drug, RCT, you do all that really well, fine. But what does it mean for my patients in my clinic, in my setting? And the traditional response for that is to say, like, give them the money for a grant and investigate and initiate a research project. But it could be that real-world data is transformative for those questions, as well as the bigger centralized regulatory pricing ones. So again, to the point, I don't, I don't think we need to say that there's only one way the health system's evolving, but they, if it fragments, then you'll get different experimentations and different opportunities. Okay. 
heterogeneity is um, star here. Sarah, nice, um, likes to make a lot of decisions for people, saying that uh, <laughs> this is, you're going to live another six months, but sorry, too costly, so bye-bye. And uh, another good decision <laughs> that NICE is doing. I'm just quoting Michael okay. Rawlings. And <laughs> yeah, I'm he likes sure. Sweden, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's not something I like how, to how, say. <laughs> how do you vet the data you get? How, how do you decide that this data we hear here, no, we don't believe that. This data, good. Um, how do you do that? How do you make that decision? So there are a number of levels within NICE ah. and most HT agencies, um, and it depends on the process that you're going through. Um, Wrong answer. <laughs> so so we, we have um, academic groups um, who are independent academic groups. They look at the data and they critically appraise it, and that's the dossiers that come in. Um, and we also have independent committees um, who look at the data, look at the information, tell us what it's saying, so, and they, they make the decision, they're independent from NICE. Um, and we also have in-house analysts whose job is to quality assure and make sure everybody's very clear about um, what the data's saying and what it's not saying. Okay. So there's a number of levels that happens. And then when, when you tell other agencies around the world yeah. how you do it, do they say, yeah, good, or do they say, no? It's more or less the same model globally. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm confident with that. Okay, I like that. I, I will come back. Okay. Any other question? Please, you were... I nearly said the man in the dog suit, but there are several. Yeah, Brian O'Rourke from Canada. Uh, mo mostly for Jeff, and I think building on Laura's question, taking it from the individual cl clinicians now back to the payer level, a lot of the data you have and the questions that you're doing, I presume, are based on the Sentinel issues and the FDA issues related to safety. Uh, if we're looking at the adaptive pathways and this confirmatory evidence and some decisions that we have to make, how many of those queries that you've been doing are based on the effectiveness questions? So within Sentinel, the questions have all been safety. Um, We've kind of the framework of Sentinel to date's been safety, so the, and, and every question comes from FDA. So actually, in fact, we're not quite sure. The same outcome is safety and effectiveness, depends, right? It's just the framing. Um, so we're not always told exactly why the question's being asked, but we believe they're all safety questions. Um, before I was at the position I am now, I was an outcomes researcher, health economist, outcomes researcher, and we used the same data to ask the same question to, we used the same data, the same, essentially the same methods to ask effectiveness questions, right? So the data could be used, used for either. Um, as Sentinel's grown up, it's, it has started in the safety realm. Okay, John? Yeah, hi, my name is Dwayne Schultes, I'm from Vital Transformation. We're working with a lot of biotechs who are interested in accelerating their portfolios because that's where we see a lot of appetite for the adaptive models, less resistance, more desire to be to the market faster, higher <laughs> desire to limit cash burn. And what we're finding is the places that we're going to do the epidemiological studies are often the ones that are most market driven and have a desire to be working in this space aggressively. And there are a couple hospital institutions in the United States that we find a huge appetite, really good data. And I find it quite frustrating because there's no reason why the UK with its 65 million patient records of up to 25 years of longitudinal data should not have by far, bar none, the best data on the planet. It should, it's there. We know it's there, it's been curated. And when we've worked with it through CPRD, it's been good quality. It's a political problem. This is a political problem. So the data is there. We know it's there. The UK should have the best database in the world. What do we need to do politically to fix this? What do we do? That's a hard you, question. Anders likes you, that, I think. No, yeah. <laughs> you stole my question, my, my final question, because who owns the power to make the decision? How are we going to use it? Who, who has the right and the power to put the foot down? That's why you're asking. You have the answer for that? Yeah. The, the answer is how data is collected by the pharmaceutical industry. It took us a long time to discipline the pharmaceutical industry to produce quality data in clinical research. We do not have that same discipline with the doctors in their offices in terms of collecting the data. 
And this is, you know, Jeff knows, uh, this is a problem. The illustration the other day by the uh, MIT professor about how all his records were wrong at Mass General was just frightening. Yeah, but, but what is your suggestion, what we should well, the, do? Shall docs, we discipline all the doctors or the, what? The, the problem is the doctors. They are king in this country. They are not scientists. They don't get the discipline in medical school that we got as scientists in the laboratory when we were doing investigations and had to write everything into little books in order to prove that we invented the drug. I mean, we kept records. And L this lucky is you not that I know doctors done. in the audience. <laughs> Otherwise, you, know, you will I, maybe I'm sorry. not the scientists come out alive. I've been disciplined, and the drug companies do it beautifully. Why we can't follow up from what is done by the drug companies into the real world befuddles. Microphone, them. microphone. Okay. I mean, I agree with exactly with the comment that was said earlier, though, in that you have to tie it to reimbursement. And, you know, part of the fee for service to fee for value transition is that there are those CMS do mandate there in there are incentives they're increasingly going to be penalties the systems like PQRS where you, you know penalties are starting to come into effect that will drive that that best practice it's, uh, to me it, it's the only way to do that so yeah it, it, it one of the issues as well, the big issues is resourcing for doing this. Um, we've got systems in place to collect data. Yes, it's variable, but whose responsibility, certainly in the UK, is it to look at those data sets and analyse them, understand what they're saying? It's a very specialist skill set. And I, I do, I find it strange that Adam has better insights into what's happening um, in the NHS than the NHS it does. Yeah. Ladies first, then you. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I'm just asking you, your commission. Yeah. Do you agree with this? Um, actually, I don't. Uh, in a, a very recent report, it has been published in July, um, uh, we have seen that um, the big data is growing at about a 40% growth rate a year. It's about sevenfold higher than the IT. The, re the requests for uh, the data analysts that would be able to make sense of all that is growing at 4% per year, and at least in Europe, it has been calculated that by 2020, we would have a deficit of 825,000 data analysts that would make sense of all that. Uh, you're generating, we are all generating an enormous amount of data, but not everything is good. Uh, it will result in a lot of studies that at the end of the day can uh, actually produce results that would be extremely important for the patients to be adopted. But you will have a plethora of them. How would you make the choices? How would you draft those guidelines? How often would you draft new guidelines that the clinicians would have to implement based on these enormous amount of data that is generated all the time. Uh, you've mentioned that Roche uh, is actually having a diagnostics next to their new development programs for 50% of them. How, what is the percentage of those that are actually implemented and they're arriving at the patients as they serve at something instead of just uh, you know, spectacular amounts of money going in, in this area of research of innovation, generating just data? but not implementable interventions. Okay. Was it your first, Mark? Okay. Well, I'm happy to respond first of all. I think it was really a, a question going to the, the data uh, holders. <coughs> I, I'm not sure I agree that this is as big a problem as it seems. I mean, yes, there is a huge amount of data coming on stream, and yes, if we try and analyze it all, we're going to be overwhelmed. But at the moment, we don't try and analyze any of it, pretty much. <laughs> So, I mean, from the starting point of just deciding, rather than seeing this as a data problem, it's a health system problem. I mean, we need to decide what it is that's wrong with our health systems and then start looking at whether these data sources are any use to actually help us do things better. And I can come up with a, a, a list pretty quickly about where we should be looking at things like the interaction between health systems and social systems, between mental health and physical um, health systems, between uh, looking at chronic diseases. I mean, they're the, they're the areas where we know that we are doing very poorly and where the data should help us to actually look at pathways more clearly. But seeing as I'm speaking, I'm also going to try and answer your 
question, Duane, because I, I think nobody else has. They've, they've tried to see it as a problem of the quality of the data. And I do agree there are issues about the quality of the data. For sure, uh, physicians are poor at filling in uh, these questionnaires. However, I mean, one of the whole points of big data is that it matters less that people uh, that don't fill in everything exactly right all the time. That's why we, we start talking about big data analytics, so that we can look at patterns in very large quantities of data. And so I don't think the reason why you're not getting access to the 25 million data records in the UK is to do with the lack of the quality of the data. I think it's to do with the fact that you're wanting to do it for for-profit purposes. And so what you're trying to do is to say there's this huge amount of data out there and you want to use it for a purpose which is for the public good, but somebody will make a profit out of it. And I think if that's the first use of, set of this sort of data, we'll never get anywhere. It's too controversial. It needs to be something much more basic about improving the safety and the quality of the health system first and then start talking about wider access to the data in the future. Crucially, okay. I think what we need, therefore, is the killer app for the use of these data. And I don't think it will be about developing some sort of microsystem. We need to show something like the appalling levels of care that are given to diabetics and trying to understand how we can do better there, or the same for people with, with Alzheimer's. It needs to be looking at those killer reasons why we need to use all the data that we have for secondary purposes rather than to try and think about how we can open it up to everybody immediately, because we're not going to manage. Sorry, we're uh, we, we have a question <laughs> over there as well. Hi, uh, Stuart Dolly from Vermillion Life Sciences. So um, I'm a big fan of uh, electronic health records and potential interoperability, but uh, uh, there's a lot of talk about it, and it's very difficult to make happen. Uh, pharma companies have their own databases. No one seems to have mentioned, particularly the pharma companies that are represented here, whether they're actually doing this at the moment, because there's a lot of talk. But even more surprisingly, I'm very, I'm very struck by the fact that we've had nothing about patient-held data and the role of that, because that, to me, also talks to the point that you just made about what matters to a diabetic or to an Alzheimer's patient, because that reflects the reality of the pain that stops them driving or going to work rather than their HbA1c or something that impacts their carer. Those are the real things that matter, and Alastair Kent made similar comments earlier today. So, interested in your views. Okay. Any comments? I mean, just, just one thought, maybe to link that question to what Roxandra said, because I think one of the, the disruptive forces that may drive more change is more about having patients understanding what's happening to them compared to other patients in the country <laughs> or across Europe. So if you're getting bad care, so if, you're, if you have a cancer diagnosis and someone hasn't done any subtyping and you could see that next door, the stand, that what happens normally for other patients in the same country as you or in an equivalent country, something very different happens in the outcome, then you would be motivated to shift that pattern of care. So I think not only as inputters of data to a system and to enable lots of different decisions being made, but I think the patients could be quite interesting in how you drive up standards, because this is essentially the quality issue Who's going to push for that? I mean, we can push, but it probably it's patients understanding the care and the options that they're not having that might be made quite persuasive to a number of systems and drive a, a proper amount of change. Uh, Richard Barker, about the same time I started thinking about this problem, um, there was a film called Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> Does anybody remember that? There were three questions. What is your name? What is your quest? And what is your favorite color? Which has always been the one that floors people. Um, it's what is your quest, really? And what I worry about is that we still think of the electronic health record as the holy grail. And you're all talking about different use cases, actually. Adam, you're talking about um, recruiting people for, pay, for, for clinical trials. Sarah is talking about the evaluation of the product, um, you know, w whether we get consistency in the way we treat diabetics and so on. I've come to the conclusion that the electronic health record cannot bear all of those questions. And that in many cases, you have to develop a system that's dedicated to collect the information that you really need. And the more you can link it to the decision support system that the doctor uses, the more likely it is that A, they will use it, and B, it will answer a relevant question. 
the, the data that we happen to collect in the course of care in the electronic health record will never, in my view, and I'm looking for someone to disagree, uh, answer all of these questions. Yeah, I mean, that's a, to me, that's an absolute fact. I mean, it, it, the, the EHA, EHRs per se are, it, you know, it's, it's a drop in the ocean in terms of the data you need to aggregate to be able to ask meaningful questions. And then when you apply the analytics to that, you have to find a way to get it back into the clinical workflow as part of, the, as part of clinical decision support, often which is in the EMR. So in order to do that, that's, you know, that's standards, that's organisations like HL7 and FIRE, and you know, those things take a while, frankly. So you, and then you layer in genomics, and they're trying to figure out how to layer that into clinical workflow you know, within an EMR. Um, and it's, it's really tough. And I, you know, I, I feel your pain in some ways with, with that. I mean, if there was a way of making that go quicker, you know, I haven't heard it yet. Yes, please. Hi, uh, BJ Pillai with Oracle. Um, one of the strange things that I've noticed over the years is that, um, you know, you have an ICD-9 or an ICD-10 code. All the coding that we do in electronic health records are all uh, reimbursement based. Um, and now as we transition from fee-for-service to value-based uh, reimbursement, why don't we think about uh, codifying uh, clinical endpoints uh, specific for various diseases, et cetera, so that you can really quantify the, uh, uh, the quality of outcome based on that. Today we have to do text mining, literature mining, or a lot of uh, f trying to get uh, patients to qu uh, quantify it, uh, it to, to try and find out uh, what's the outcome uh, of the patient. So love to get your perspective on that. Okay. Yeah, I think we had a hand over there as well. Yeah, uh, Bertrand Yunazi Janssen. Um, it's, it's more a comment than a question, rather. Um, and it's building on what Richard was saying. Um, I agree and disagree. Um, and it's, as was said yesterday, it's horses for courses, obviously. Um, and it would be an utter shame if we couldn't use the EHR data. I mean, we have to do that. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's our moral duty to make it uh, as useful as possible. And of course, pushing towards more quality measured outcome is indeed going to drive doctors to enter better data. But I think one of the challenges for doctors is that they don't see the return coming back from what they are asked to enter other than maybe reimbursement. And of course, follow the money is as old as, old as chercher la femme. But uh, I, I think that Doctors are also looking for more than just reimbursement. I think if, we, if they can get benchmarked information back on the quality of how they perform their, uh, their job for their entirety of patients and not just one patient in particular, I think that we will see an improvement in uh, the quality of data being entered because there is a return. And then secondly, um, I don't believe that the answer is to install registers for everything or that the authorities are uh, asking for registers to be installed. I mean, we have reached the point of saturation. Doctors, hospitals don't want to enter data twice, thrice, four times, f five times. So we're, we're seeing now a consolidation of uh, entry within uh, something that is, I, I mean, it should optimize the usage of the EHR system and only ask for additional data if and when required. But, but the sorry, it's not a question, it's no, a comment. Very few questions here, a lot of statements. But uh, that's doctor's view is only one. We have the patient's view as well. And uh, so my question will be also why, how can we make that pathway easier to make it work? We have it, we have it again, I say it again, with the pharmacovigilance regulation in Europe, that patients have the right to do side effects report into the government directly, not through the doctors, directly from themselves. But the government doesn't support that. So no one knows about it. And so that's maybe we need to be pushing as well, because if we're going to have most of the data, which is defined in the real world evidence, is not the doctor's interpretation, it's mine. As a patient, my interpretation, my view of it. That has to bring into it as well. If we're going to make a change, otherwise it's Gone, become more and more and more of the same. Now I get angry. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know now if I should I go get next. 
but I, I get a little uh, fed up. There's you a little know, bit because of we have the data. There is available. We want to produce them. We want to share them with you. But don't push us into mm. some the same corner as before. Because the world that is the best world which we would like to do and how we would like to interact into it, that's a different way. It's change. It has to change in some way. We have to change the healthcare system. We have to change the budgetarian system. And who's going to do that? We have a former minister in here. I asked him, where are you? There you are. <laughs> I asked you, can your fellow colleagues open up the budget? And they looked at me, tired, no, no way. <laughs> But I ask if I ask the prime minister so to order them. No, no, no. He has no power. Who has? Is it you guys? <laughs> Why? No, no, no. I'm, I'm serious. Why not? Because you you have the skills. So we can make you five. We we'll lock you in a room, and we say we will not let you out until you agree. <laughs> Agreeing's probably easy. Doing it's hard. No, no. You uh, don't get any food <laughs> until you agree. <laughs> But there is, so there's a thread. It's not a vacation <laughs> home. <laughs> so there is a thread here, um, and Adam started it with, um, where, <laughs> no, no, it was good. Um, well, because I said it's all about the money, but, there, um, but there's a piece of competition here that doesn't actually exist that could. If, if when I was choosing a clinician or a hospital, I knew their infection rate, the app, um, and I could choose the hospital that has a lower surgical site infection rate, I might do that. That might incentivize a hospital to actually collect that information. Because, so, but currently, we're not, there's not particularly much competition with patients going to docs, because basically so. it's blinded. You're like, I heard that guy's good, is how people pick physicians. But if I actually knew that this doc was actually good compared to his peers, maybe the the clinicians would start to collect data to prove that. Um, and you also see, so this is another one of my soccer, soccer conversations with the spine surgeon who lives in my town. He said, so, so he runs a spine surgery clinic. And it's like, how did you, the only way he's figured out how to get his clinicians to change is he has a big board up front that compares all the docs on whatever metric they choose. The last one they did was um, surgical waste. Just, you know, you're doing surgery and you waste a bunch of screws, that's bad, that's just waste. And you just put it up there and <laughs> docs change really fast. Because they didn't know, because all know, it's, that's ego, right? They all want to be above the average. So they all changed how they reacted. It had nothing to do with payment. It was, it was actually just competition in the clinic was what they used to do it. Okay. We're running out. Each of you, if you want to do, say something in 38 seconds, please. <laughs> um, I, I think my take home point and just moving on that is, is the art and the science of analyzing this data because you have to be very, very careful. And I, I, when we start talking about apps, I get very concerned because we've had a couple of forays into doing exactly that with data and you have to start thinking about case mix and you have to actually start really understanding what's going on beneath the data. And those problems are, are really quite acute with this real world data. Very quickly, I and mean, of course, there is a lot of evidence, not so much from the US, but from Europe, about um, competition on the basis of quality with quite complex messages. It does seem to work moderately well at the hospital level, but that isn't necessarily, of course, at the clinician level. At the primary care level, much less evidence. And indeed, one of the theories about what's going on is really that it's not that people want to be above average. They care very much about being at the bottom of the league tables. But it's hard to actually move people who aren't near the bottom. As long as they're doing okay, getting that competition, uh, getting the, the, the physicians and the managers to react to being average, they don't seem to very much, unfortunately. Well, do I get a comment? So I'm just going to agree with Sarah. Uh, <laughs> very good. Next. <laughs> I just say not collecting the data isn't an option anymore. No, I agree on that. And there, there is stuff we can do now. So I think Rich's point that we're not gonna, it's not going to be perfect, and that's fine. I think there's a lot we can do now. Just get on with it. That's okay. Fine. If I'm going to sum up this, I would say I'm worried. What I'm hearing, I'm worried that we are, haven't come further in this matter. But I'm confident and I'm a little happy that we are in the room because we would like, I, I can feel that, we would like to solve the same problem. We, we are now talking about the same problem, which is a really major step forward. So I'm, I'm very happy that this 
meeting and this conference is organized and I look forward to the follow-up. But again, as always, it's up to us or it's up to everyone to uh, take a lead and really move forward there because there is no one who's going to fix it for us. So thank you very much, everyone, for your engagement and thank you all of you.